لا انا جيت انا 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 جيت يعني منارة البرنامج الدكتور حمشي فجيت عند اجلس شويه جيت لقيت مكاني رئيس رئيس البرنامج فما مسترجع احكي ما استرجع احكي Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth day of the winter school. My name is Ayat Hamdan, a researcher at the Arab Center, and I am honored to have the chance to introduce Professor Abdul Wahab Al Afendi for today's uh, opening lecture. And I am sure that uh, most of you know Professor Al Afendi and his work, but let me introduce him briefly be before we move to his lecture. Uh, Professor Al Afendi is the president of the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies, the DI. He previously served as the as dean of the School of Social Science and Humanities from 2017 to 2020, and head of the Politics and International Relations Program from 2015 to 2017 at the DI. He acquired his PhD in political science in 1989 from the University of Reading, and he is the founding coordinator of the Democracy and Islam program at the University of Westminster from 1998 to 2015. He has also worked as a pilot, London-based Sudanese diplomat, journalist, and magazine editor in the UK. He is the author of Who Needs an Islamic State in 1991, among other books and research published in peer-reviewed journal. Without any further delay, Professor Al Effendi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ayat. I think uh, the norm was probably to mention somebody's last book, and our last book is, uh, uh, is uh, After the Arab Revolution, uh, Decentering uh, Democratic uh, transition theory, and I think also uh, I, I always like to trumpet my pride, which is genocide and nightmares, uh, narrative insecurity, and, uh, and the logic of mass atrocities, which I think uh, I recommend reading it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm going to begin with a story. Uh, many moons ago, in the early 90s, I, uh, I was invited to a conf series of conferences in Atlanta, the Carter Center. Uh, and of course, Sudan was uh, figuring uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the program. And uh, President Carter and his team uh, had a meeting with me, a preparatory meeting before the start to discuss uh, how to tackle the issue. And then at the end of the meeting, uh, President Carter said, why don't we try to get a, an informal meeting for the various sides in Sudanese conflict? Uh, and I said to him, I saw them at lunch this afternoon, and they were all fraternizing very jovially. And he, <laughs> he immediately uh, said, uh, I mean, you Sudanese, you really confuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, a couple of years before, he was chairing a Sudanese peace talk between the rebels and the government in Nairobi. And he said, I spent the night preparing jokes because I said when they came in, the atmosphere would be frigid, and so I will uh, try to uh, cheer up a little bit. And he said, we walked into the meeting room. And the rebel delegation came from this side, and the government from this side, and each of them start hugging each other, uh, asking about their children and their families, and this took a very long time. <laughs> and he said, I, I was looking like this, he said, why are these people fighting? And, uh, but of course, when they sat for the talks, they were not that friendly. <laughs> so uh, I think this is uh, one uh, point I'd like to highlight to show that, <coughs> uh, uh, culture 
can is not a, a very reliable indicator about how uh, how things yani, operate uh, and how political conduct is conducted. Uh, in Sudanese culture, we have this uh, this uh, let's say uh, hospitality spirit that you even strangers, even enemies, you always welcome them. And I, I had a recollection in my uh, early teen years when I was traveling on a train to Khartoum and with a, an elder relative. And the guy was upset because some people in the, in the compartment were a bit rowdy and telling rude jokes. And when we reached the midway, this was an overnight train, when we reached the midway to Khartoum, he said, we're going to, this, to alight here at this station and take the next train which comes in the afternoon. I said, it's about 3 o'clock in the morning. Where are we going to go? He said, don't worry, I have friends here. And I said, it's, in the, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. We can't go and knock the door. He said, don't worry. We'll go to the mosque near their house. They're going to come for the dawn prayer. Then we go with them home. And lo and behold, <laughs> He <laughs> went to the mosque, and the guys came, and of course greeted us warmly, took us home, uh, gave us hot tea and a clean choice for clothes to sleep in. We slept nicely, then we woke up, there was a very nice breakfast, and they took us around to see other people, then they made a very uh, sumptuous dinner, and invited neighbors and friends, and we spent a very nice, lovely afternoon, uh, and then they walked us to the train, I never saw these people again. <laughs> but so, uh, so there is this spirit. But of course, Sudan is reputed for being one of, has one of the most brutal wars and still does have very dysfunctional politics. And uh, I'm going to uh, uh, later to, uh, to maybe venture an explanation for this. But I think uh, already, uh, uh, in his uh, talk, uh, uh, the, in the opening, Dr. Azmi has quoted uh, Bar uh, Barrington Moore on the the way, for example, northern and southern American uh, uh, culture uh, diverged, although everything about culture is the same. People came from the same European countries. They have the same Protestant religion, and so on and so on. <coughs> so uh, now I'm going to... <coughs> Summarize the questions I'm, ask, I'm going to ask here and answer in uh, three questions. <clears throat> the, per, the first uh, re, re, relates to the point of my title, how uh, political culture is defined. And uh, many times, it can be a proxy for race. Uh, second, <clears throat> I think, and the more fundamental question is, uh, why does political culture, especially when defined, in, defined tautologically at the sum of collective orientations uh, towards politics, fail to determine political conduct? And I think this is, the, this is not, the question is not that political culture does dictate political conduct. The question is why it often does not. And I think this is the raison d'etre of politics, of political science. Uh, that's a question they have been asked since Machiavelli, and Ibn Khaldun even before that. Uh, the third related question, uh, the, if that although, as many uh, exponents of the, uh, of the uh, theory and the discourse on political culture uh, mention, uh, the, the discussion of political culture has always been there. It goes back to antiquity, Plato, Aristotle, Thucydides, and, and, and the others. So why, why in the 1950s did it become a topic? Uh, suddenly, that it is something relevant. And the, the, uh, many of the answers, I think, given usually uh, refer to a, a turn in behaviorism, behavioralism and I would say an, maybe an about turn in behavioralism. Uh, <coughs> so uh, <coughs> these questions are related. Uh, and uh, I start with the conflictual dimension of culture. 
shouldn't be a surprise because I think most cultures emerge out of conflict and in conflict. Uh, there's always a, there is a perennial rift between insiders and outsiders, privileged and less fortunate. Communities also absorb immigrants or expand in neighboring territories or succumb to invasions. Uh, so all communities ha also have subordinate components, blips, commoners, slaves, lower castes. Uh, often prevalent culture incorporates elements uh, <coughs> trying to justify these uh, uh, disadvantageous situations. Then often prophets and other rebels emerge to argue otherwise. Uh, maybe at that time some religions uh, are formed, and, but these religions also immediately descend into sects and schools and often go at war with each other. So <coughs> usually today's political culture is yesterday's heresy. I mean, Rome, for example, became Christian after spending centuries feeding Christians to lions. And immediately, the Christians split into many sects and started fighting. Uh, and so the Reformation and, and all th these things, uh, uh, and the, uh, today's liberal, liberal Europe, for example, emerged out of vicious religious wars, inquisition, brutal colonial conquest, racial oppression, misogyny, and of course, the Holocaust. The US hist in US history, genocide was the aperitif. It started with genocide and then went up from there, conquest, uh, uh, slavery, civil war, inordinate amounts of criminal, racist, and inter-ethnic violence. Uh, some of this has continued until 1970 and is worsening as we speak. Uh, and I think, uh, this leads us to, to the way the term culture is used, actually. In its origins, culture used to refer to high culture, that people are cultured when they are the erudite, the elite, uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, later, or most recently, in the, uh, 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 with anthropology, uh, Changes started to say well. Uh, even I think in uh, in the in the early phase, uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, there is always a contrast between our culture, which is usually the good one, and the other culture, which is barbarians or foreigners or savages and so on and so on. So this uh, <coughs> uh, in in the modern anthropology. Uh, definitions of culture, uh, we have uh, moved somewhat to equation of cultures that, well, every, ed, every community has its own culture. So culture became a little more, more generic, but still, uh, in most uh, cases, uh, it is always, uh, <coughs> uh, there is a hierarchy of, of cultures, even implicit that there are cultures there are more cultures than others. But I think, uh, <coughs> uh, in especially, uh, uh, I discussed this uh, a few years ago about uh, the controversy about Obama, or President Barack Obama, uh, because I think we can trace the madness which runs around uh, uh, President, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, uh, Donald Trump, <laughs> to the fact that America has elected its first black uh, African-American president. For uh, the traditionalists, for the, uh, the Civil War uh, 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 Confederates, this was uh, an insult. But uh, when they try to portray this in, uh, in cultural terms, I think this is where culture and race replace each other. You cannot find a merge, uh, a, an individual who's more American than Barack Obama. I believe his uh, language is English, his religion is Protestant, he's cultured, he's a lawyer, he is the best uh, in, 
uh, Amer representative of America. Uh, but you find people like Giuliani or others who, uh, Catholics, Italians, who maybe their uh, original language of their ancestors is not English, uh, and many others who uh, claim to be more American than him. I don't think there's somebody more American than the black Americans because they come to America without any culture. They have been deprived of their culture. Every other Polish and Germans and French and everybody come with their language, their culture, their religion. So they are not really as American as the people who are 100% American. Uh, but anyway, so this is, this is why one of the main abuses of culture. Now, <coughs> the valuation of culture usually uh, works at several levels, uh, uh, as I said. There is uh, the one I mentioned uh, about uh, our culture versus their culture. Uh, even, for example, in the, in the olden days, for example, Ath near neighbors, Athens and Sparta, they might, each of them have their own uh, approach. Uh, but uh, uh, as, and you label, uh, you label outsiders as, as, um, as, um, uh, as savages usually, but also inside the countries, inside the communities, they are also uh, working class and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, so, uh, so if, if we look at the way identities uh, have emerged, uh, we, we can, I, I will skip on this because uh, uh, there is uh, many other examples I was going to give, for example, about Britain or others. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the main question which I will come to now is that if political culture is defined uh, with relevance to political conduct in tautological terms, because you say certain mental position uh, people hold, particular beliefs about the world, how the world works, certain values they honor, and various practical commitments to which they subscribe. Uh, this is Almond, or uh, <coughs> collective programming of the mind, uh, which distinguish a member of human group from another. Uh, all the, say, when you say that every a political system is embedded in a particular pattern of orientation and political actions, uh, so so uh, <coughs> uh, if you say this, then why should it not be? that this political culture should determine political behavior and conduct because you are defining it in the way people are oriented towards their politics. Uh, but I think uh, uh, the, uh, the problem, I think, uh, is that uh, when the, with the uh, uh, establishment of political science or the early genesis of political science, if we look at it from Ibn Khaldun through uh, Machiavelli, through uh, uh, Hobbes, uh, the notion or the problem which was posed is not uh, that political culture should determine conduct, but about why it does not. And in case of Machiavelli, why it should not? Uh, the idea is that uh, from Ibn Khaldun, that politics has its own logic. Uh, its logic is power. In, in, in the state of the Khaldun, it is Asabiya. That uh, politics has nothing to do with culture. It's a, a transcultural thing. And uh, he is, for example, uh, he specifically mentioned uh, religious idealism, which was, and he said, these fanatics who uh, turn up and want to change things uh, to be the right way according to what God said and what the prophet said, they don't understand the world. The world doesn't work this way. These people are uh, uh, negligent of how the world works. The world doesn't work this way. It works in different ways. You have to have asabi, you have to have power. So power is seen here as independent of culture. Uh, and so the, uh, uh, the, the, 
the science of politics as a science was uh, opposed to this idea of culture as a, as a term or explanation. You, are, you want to explain what happens in terms of power relations, in terms of uh, uh, who has uh, what power, who has what desires, and also uh, how things uh, work. <coughs> Uh, again, uh, the, uh, uh, this also raises the, the second question, which I will go to, uh, about then why did a political culture became an, is an issue in political science in the 1950s and 60s? Uh, and and the, uh, uh, the solution to this real, I think, I, I don't know whether Stephen Walsh is here. I think he was... Uh, uh, he, he actually explained it, saying that uh, 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 the, um, uh, the, this, this change was a leading token of the behavioral revolution. That behavioralists were decided, especially when uh, 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 with, uh, with the techniques of survey, surveying, uh, that, well, political culture could be an explanation. And this, of course, is an important about turn because behavioralism was uh, a thinking of, uh, of behavior in causality, stimulus, and, and response. Uh, so to introduce culture, for, to introduce culture, and they, they sought interpretive uh, analyses were unscientific. You have to have quantitative, you have to have. Uh, so, but this was an interesting way of bringing uh, interpretation from the back door. Uh, by uh, instead of uh, saying culture or uh, to, to, be, to use it is in a quantitative way. And uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, Almut himself, actually, uh, <coughs> uh, argues that they did this because of disillusionment with the Enlightenment, uh, after, especially after the uh, Second World War, and the uh, disappointment of the optimistic liberal uh, expectation of continuous political progress. So uh, they, uh, in fact, uh, so that actually liberal politics and liberal culture did not uh, seem to uh, to achieve what was looked for it, and that's why they decided that, uh, given the opportunity of offered by survey research, to adopt this methodology of looking at actual culture, and of course, uh, the assumption behind this is that you can politically influence culture that you can make a civic culture in certain ways. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, 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 but uh, of course, there are problems uh, with this. Uh, there were, uh, <coughs> uh, some people uh, are saying that, uh, in a sense, a political culture as an explanatory variable was, uh, in fact, made as a residual. A, uh, explanation for things which you could not find for it explanations. Uh, it's also uh, problematic because when you, uh, uh, when in, uh, uh, the uh, culture is supposed to be across regions, but the research of the culture, uh, political culture theorist, usually looks at one country at a time. And this also creates a problem. Uh, <coughs> in any way, uh, also as uh, uh, one analyst said, uh, the, there is a problem of what they call receding cause and receding effect. If you con 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 concentrate on the, on the cause, which is political culture, suddenly the uh, the, 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 the effects disappear. And if you cons cons consist, concentrate on the, uh, uh, on the uh, effects, the causes disappear. 
So, uh, so uh, if we look at uh, uh, the, the the idea of the circularity in the uh, uh, in the definitions, then uh, we we bec we 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 have to uh, I think go back to uh, what politics and what Machiavelli and others tried. But also, uh, in addition to, circu to, circularity, to the circularity, there is uh, 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 maybe Adam Sivorsky's uh, uh, adage, which that democracy is the contingent outcome of conflict. Uh, and this also applies to culture, I think. Uh, culture is itself also, as we, we mentioned earlier, uh, becomes the uh, uh, the outcome of, as we said, of conflicts. Uh, for example, uh, protest. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, analysts from Weber down, for example, use the Protestant ethic as an explanatory variable. Now, uh, we know that uh, Protestantism was and remains a minority belief among Christians, and but. We have at the moment a kind of uh, uh, of uh, consensus between Catholics and, and of course, uh, uh, non-religious uh, uh, Westerners about some some melange of culture, which is not neither Christian, although, uh, as Azmi uh, rightly pointed out, uh, the, uh, there's nothing called Judeo-Christian, but it, it's a label which. Uh, sometimes uh, refer to this uh, to this label. Uh, again, I think, uh, 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 if I may cite uh, Bishara again, uh, the the cultural traits themselves uh, might dictate contradictory. I go back now to the Sudanese uh, issue. Uh, Bishara points out that, for example, when we uh, somebody, for example, who is uh, who wants to be subservient to authoritarianism, although I, I don't believe that such thing exists, but let us suppose that a category like this, uh, like the authoritarian personality exists. Uh, this person could be authoritarian in all, could follow, for example, the authoritarian regime that exists. But he might also follow an authoritarian rebel movement which he defies this regime, a, a left wing or right wing or religious or whatever. Uh, so. Authoritarianism does not uh, uh, does not is not a reliable indicator to what the person will do. The same thing, uh, somebody who might be a law-abiding or pro might follow any law which exists, uh, and uh, doesn't matter what law, but he is follow he is following the law. So, uh, uh, in this regard, if I if I go back to uh, uh, to the Sudanese case. Uh, there is this, uh, as I said, hospitality, and also which implies communal life. Uh, when we grew up, uh, the, the, there were no closed doors here in the in the neighborhood. Every door is open. People walk in and out. You eat your food with your uncle, with your family, with your aunt, with your neighbor, with your friend. So it's always like this. It's a community. Uh, it has also some political uh, consequences for corruption, for example, because for politicians, especially parliamentarians, uh, the hospitality, which is voluntary for most other people, is not voluntary. If you are you're usually elected from a tribal constituency, now. Your house, your home is the home of the tribe. And as a minister, you might have limited number, unlimited number of guests, visitors, and pressures, for example, employ my son, employ my uh, uncle, my niece, uh, and so on. Uh, so then politics becomes, you have, where do you get the money to fulfill your duties which is by the system, these are, are duties, not, they are not options. 
you have to find money from wherever it is in order to uh, entertain your guests. You should have also very crooked ways to talk to this uh, person and this person to employ this person and give them favoritism. Uh, but also, <coughs> the communal identity becomes crucial in conflict. If you, for example, insult a member of the group or the tribe, you have insulted us all. So you have to fight and you have to... Uh, uh, so that's why you find this uh, uh, hospitality, it merges with conflict. It merges with corruption. And... Uh, uh, it can, it can, so it's not, uh, there's not guarantee how, how it works or why it works. And uh, we have a legend about, uh, uh, there were two uh, early Islamic states in, in the 17th century in Sudan. And one of them was called Tagali, which was in a mountainous area. And the kingdom of Sinar decided to go and invade that uh, state and annex it. <clears throat> but it was, uh, since it was very difficult, they were, they besieged it and started fighting. So they said, the king of that uh, state, when the fighting ends in the evening, will send food to the invading army downstairs and say, you are our guests, we cannot. Uh, and they, when they kept doing this, uh, the people that were shamed into saying, well, we cannot continue with this. <laughs> this guy is sending us food and uh, we are fighting him. So they, they made a, a, tr a treaty and, and left. But see, I mean, this is again uh, an indication. I think I'll stop here and let you ask questions. Thank you very much, Professor Abdul Wahab. <clears throat> we'll open the floor for the Q&A. Let's start from the right side here. Yes, please. Uh, thank, thank you for the lecture. I found it um, very. Name, please. Uh, oh, Joseph. Um, I'm a PhD student. Um, so yeah, thank you. I found it very uh, fascinating. I was uh, sort of wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on uh, how you're understanding culture, um, in part because it wasn't clear to me um, the like definition or the conceptualization. I heard a lot of discussion about conflict and kind of this idea that conflict and culture are inherently linked. And I wasn't, I guess I wasn't completely persuaded of this. Um, I can see where conflict is, um, of course, important and like conceptualizing culture, but I'm not sure if it makes sense of all um, the, the what, we're, what we're thinking of when we think about culture. Um, and I think that's important because it, is influencing the way you're thinking about politics as inherently conflict-driven. But that, of course, depends on your assumption about what you mean by culture. And so uh, I, I wonder if you can clarify the link between culture and politics um, and, yeah, just kind of elaborating a little bit more by what you meant by it. Thank you. Thank you. More question, Dr. Hanafi. Thank you so much for, uh, for your uh, amazing talk, uh, Abdul Wahab. Um, well, uh, you, 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 you put this region in awkward uh, situation because uh, religion, for me, it's a, it's a form of culture. Uh, if you take religion as a, uh, as a form of, of culture, uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, I mean, we, we, don't, uh, we don't want uh, to think like, uh, Islam is a solution. This is those who think culture is everything, religion is everything. Nor uh, to say that uh, uh, religion is not uh, important at all, and uh, uh, and through secularization, uh, everyone will uh, uh, behave in outside of uh, religious culture. So. Uh, so uh, the case of the region is that religion is not out of, of conflict emerged. This is, yeah, okay, let's stop. Thank you. Uh, I have a question drawing on your work on genocide. You, I think one of the theses you defend is that narratives are constitutive to conflict 
ultimately leading to genocide. Now, where would you put these narratives? Are, aren't they part of culture? I mean, I find your thesis today very interesting that, um, that cultures are outcomes of conflict and not the other way around. But at the same time, you also defend the idea that narratives c lead to conflict. So how do, you, how do you deal with that? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, hi, my name is Julia. I'm a PhD candidate. Thank you for your talk. I think that throughout those days, we are trying to um, grasp like the meaning of political culture, and I'm understanding it's not an easy task, so thank you for your contribution. And throughout your talk, you mentioned issues related to race, for sure, to religion. And so I was actually wondering, what's your take on who determines what political culture is, which is, I think, a question that we should all ask ourselves in this context of the conference. Because, of course, we have different elements of minoritization, for instance, like cl uh, class, race, gender, reli religion, sexual orientation, geographies. And so I think that sometimes we do tend to associate political culture with uh, what the majority of the population is. And then we come back and we say, no, but this is not homogeneous. We need to understand also the minorities. But how do we do that? And like connected to the question that you just received on genocide, what are the risks if we do not, if we are not able to really grasp the complexities of all of those variables? And so what voices do matters? And again, who determines what political culture is, is somehow a, a question that I'm asking to you today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for interesting question. And I start about uh, the first question about uh, culture and conflict. Uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, the fact that cultures, uh, as I said, are both a contingent uh, 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 outcome of conflicts and also a conflictual uh, is probably quite obvious because uh, if we look at, uh, for example, as I said, liberalism, for example, as an outcome of the uh, religious wars, outcome of class wars, outcome of uh, racist uh, tendencies. And if we take, for example, the American Civil War. The American Civil War started as a conflict uh, over slavery. But this was actually a, a, a proxy for many other things. I mean, slavery was uh, the, the main issue, but there were uh, other issues of difference. Then when the, uh, the American Civil War ended, uh, there was a kind of uh, a reconciliation, let's put it. And this reconciliation was actually more skewed to the values of the South. I mean, I was, uh, uh, I'm not uh, that familiar with American politics, but I was shocked in recent years when, uh, uh, when uh, I realized that uh, President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson was one of the most racist presidents the, the country has uh, had made, and he's also the most promoter of democracy and liberalism around the world. So there was this melange uh, which America is still suffering uh, from, and I think the recent, uh, uh, I have actually uh, written for our conference in, uh, uh, in March uh, another paper about the culture wars, which also indicate how culture, uh, uh, as I is like language culture. Uh, you have, uh, you imbibe it like language sometimes without understanding grammar. The children, they uh, speak language perfectly, in perfect grammar, without having learned grammars like us foreigners, for example, we have to learn English, we have to understand the grammar first. But the natural way when we learned Arabic, we learned it without knowing what the grammar is. Similarly, culture is imbibed without people even understanding what it is. They, it becomes part of you. But then, uh, there, there is always a questioning from your side to the culture and questions from others too, and conflict, for example, if culture is racist, 
uh, it puts you in direct conflict with people who are victims of racism. And this will lead you either to reconsider or to become even more racist and more violent. And we see, for example, what's happening in Israel today is moving in, a, in an interesting direction. Uh, so in this, uh, in this regard, uh, culture uh, is evolving. Uh, and it's changed sometimes by internal reason, sometimes by war, sometimes by uh, uh, seeing other examples by the media. But when it starts changing, then you have usually violence because the threatened category who feel, uh, uh, who, uh, feel threatened by it, they, uh, uh, they fight back. And, and this leads me to the issue of narratives of, of insecurity. Uh, usually, the, uh, uh, the, the narratives, uh, insecurity is usually constructed. Uh, for example, when uh, people say, well, uh, immigrants are going to uh, destroy our culture. They are going to change our system of the world. I mean, the famous uh, rivers of war uh, speech of uh, Enoch Powell in the 1960s that blacks are going to take over Britain and we, ha we, we are threat well, our whole country is threatened. And now also uh, uh, Trump and the others saying that look at what's going to happen, these liberals are going to destroy the country or even sometimes the economic policies, for example, of liberals are going to destroy the country. So uh, the, the construction of of insecurity, uh, yes, depends on narratives. Uh, and narratives are constructs. And uh, uh, they, they can be uh, succumbed to. I mean, we see in many countries now in Europe, for example, right-wing uh, populism and racism became uh, uh, no longer, uh, as somebody said about France, people are no longer ashamed, for example, to say uh, we are racist or, or, or not that uh, 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 I remember I uh, was in France uh, many years ago, and uh, the taxi driver was upset. We, we Sudanese people were sitting in the back and chatting and speaking, and some of us were smoking. And then he stopped and, uh, and, and said, get, that, get out of my car. And then uh, he says to us in impeccable French, he says, le racisme, ça existe. Mais ce sont toujours les blancs qui sont racistes. Yeah. Racism exists, but you, you accuse us. He, may, he was implying that we were behaving in a racist manner. Uh, and so the, the, the kind of, uh, 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 of the, the, the racist and the white supremacist now portray themselves as the victims. We are the minority who are being uh, uh, prevented from speaking freely. We can no longer call niggers niggers, what is this word coming to? This, uh, is, uh, this is a human right, <laughs> and so on and so on. So uh, the, the, uh, the way narratives are constructed, uh, they, they justify the unjustifiable. So for example, if I believe that uh, the flux of immigrants from Latin America is going to take over the country and destroy it, so I wouldn't mind building a wall. I wouldn't mind having guns or uh, airplanes to bomb them if they are coming. That's like the, the, the movie World Y Z, where you see that uh, if you are watching the film and you see that uh, the zombies are being uh, massacred, you wouldn't say, see any other way. That's a way. If you, if you construct narrative in this way, that these are a threat, and there's no other way to end this threat other than to kill them, even if they are your children or your wife or whatever, you become the zombie, you have to kill them. That's how it is. So the narratives actually, more than the, the culture, uh, they frame, they frame the, the, uh, the action field. If I believe the narratives of Trump, I will be a racist. If I believe the narrative of the National Front, that Islam is now going to take over, yeah, why not? We should actually throw all Muslims out and so on and so on. So, but narratives are not culture. Narratives are constructed within the culture. And the same culture, uh, as in the same language, you have a lot of terms of abuse <laughs> you can use, and uh, as well as terms of, 
of friendship in culture also you can construct narrative which for example uh, portray some people as outside and uh, portray some people as inside uh, so uh, have I answered all the question okay thank you very much for that lecture I, I enjoyed it and I, I learned a lot from it, actually, particularly when you were talking about behavioralism. But I'll, I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, but I did want to make a comment on um, what you said early in the lecture about anthropology and culture, um, which I think inflected your your overall, your, your larger discussion of culture and race. Um, when, when the culture concept sort of crystallized in anthropology, it wasn't actually as a synonym for race, it was as an antidote to it. Because in the very earliest roots of the discipline, the, you know, kind of the organizational schemes for understanding the world by Europeans were racial. Um, and the assumption was that there were different degrees of humanity among the different races. Culture was actually an antidote to this. Um, it was an acknowledgement that all people are equally human but that some people had radically different cultures than others. And it created two problems for them. One, and, and actually, I also I was going to say this yesterday when we had the question about the, the problem of um, the distinction between collective constructions and individual agency. So it created two problems. One was that once they developed that conception of culture, they had to imagine cultures as being coherent and bounded. And once they started doing that, they could no longer really have any useful tools for understanding how cultures change, so they had to understand them synchronically, which is why this whole idea of structural functionalism developed. And so you could understand radically different cultures in a kind of structural functionalist way to understand how they work, but the assumption was that they were fully human. All human beings were equally cultural. Um, but these, these two problems of the, the boundedness of culture and the inability to explain how things changed caused immense problems to the discipline for much of its history. And that's the reason why anthropologists no longer like culture. They, and, and actually, the, the cultural concept that anthropologists use now, which I referred to yesterday as culture substitutes, um, actually, I just realized listening to is very much like what political scientists used to call behavioralism, or perhaps still do, um, except that anthropologists never really had much interest in kind of quantifying behavioral patterns or in uh, understanding them through uh, um, theories about causality. Anthropologists were never terribly interested in causality. Um, but I, I think when you're, when you're talking about the kind of racialization of culture and the larger argument that you're making, I think that actually works in terms of political rhetoric, in terms of the way the world works. Um, and you know, you're talking about Trump and um, you know uh, the, the Enoch Powell and, and you know that sort of thing. Um, very true. Uh, and, and in that context, culture is a dangerous concept. But I just wanted to say that anthropologists don't see culture that way anymore for precisely that reason, because you know sometimes. I guess around the 60s and 70s, they began to realize that culture was an immensely problematic term, and they stopped using it in the, in the sense that they used to. Thank you. So I believe this is the last question, or there's uh, more? OK. Um, Thank you. That oh, yes, please. Um, hi, I'm Narmeen. I'm a PhD student at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, first, I would just like to say that I found your lecture to be fascinating, and I would have to actually agree with almost everything you've said, especially the examples that you've used for the U.S. Um, so I just have a question. What is your framework on path dependency and when it comes to conflict? I did note something you mentioned that when conflict does arise, the agents, some of them will fight back, so culture changes and it shifts and it might be flexible. But I just want to know, within your framework, how does this culture function in a state of conflict and then 
post-conflict, what happens to culture and these agents? Like, exactly how does the culture change? Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Of course, I defer you on uh, the way the anthropology um, uh, looks at, uh, at culture. Uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, the point I wanted to make is, uh, rightly you pointed to that, uh, in, in uh, uh, what Edward said called Orientalism, uh, and he was criticized because he, uh, he likened what, uh, or he linked what was said in Greek times to what is seen in modern, and this is a little bit of, uh, uh, of reductionism. Uh, but I think uh, Said has rightly pointed to the way culture has been used as, uh, especially in Oriental literature and also in the general, uh, uh, let us say, uh, uh, political discourse uh, in the West as, as, in fact, a proxy to race uh, in the sense that uh, people, for example, this Arab mind or Arab culture or uh, that, for example, uh, uh, Arabs are, are, are not suitable for democracy because, for example, their culture is authoritarian. And as I uh, said in uh, my question in an earlier lecture, uh, uh, the, uh, the reality that, for example, the Arab regimes have to be so brutal means that people are not happy with authoritarianism. They were happy will have if I have authoritarianism and people who are, their culture favors authoritarianism, you'll be happy, in a happy world. But it's a very unhappy world and there's lots of resistance, more than in other, other uh, region, for authoritarianism. There's authoritarianism in China, there is in Burma, there is in many in, in South, North Korea, but resistance to authoritarianism is strong and sometimes bloody in the Arab world because people don't like it, don't, they, they like their freedom. Uh, but uh, uh, in, in this sense, the, uh, uh, I, I gave the example, for example, of Obama American blacks who are culturally very American, but the, the so-called Americans uh, don't uh, see them as American and they think them as something uh, alien. Uh, the same happened with the Jews in Germany, for example. They are more German than any other German, and the, culture, the, the cultural uh, the German culture was actually uh, contributed to by uh, a lot of the, the Jews. But uh, uh, in this way, then the, uh, uh, they are not seen as German by the uh, people. And unfortunately, of course, now uh, right-wing uh, fascism has uh, arisen in Europe, all over Europe now again. Uh, again, uh, culture is not the issue. Uh, there may be many uh, uh, Arab or Africans in France who are culturally uh, superior to many of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the other French uh, uh, persons, but they are not accepted. They are seen just because of the color of their race and they speak about multiculturalism uh, in, in, in seeing that the, the differences, uh, which are not really differences in culture in a sense. Uh, there are differences maybe in conduct in, in this and that, but anyway, uh, so uh, if, uh, uh, can you remind me the question again? It was, uh, sorry. It was regarding path to dependency and like how culture changes, well, uh, yes, culture changes yes, within yes, conflict yes, and yes, post-conflict. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, I think the, uh, as I said, culture is always changing because a living culture evolves, develops, and uh, uh, is developed uh, sometimes by conduct, sometimes by, uh, uh, for example, uh, you, you spoke about Islam. Uh, uh, when Islam uh, started, uh, of course, it was one religion, it continues to be one religion. But even in those early uh, uh, years, people who moved to different uh, geographic areas, for example, Egypt, Iraq, they started to see variation, for example, in the way they read the Quran, variation in the way they conducted 
their uh, prayers, variation in other things, which sometimes is uh, because of the cultures they were mixing with. That's why, for example, at one point, uh, Osman, uh, Khalifa Osman decided to have a written uh, version of the Quran to make sure that there is only a standard, one standard Quran and to stop the differences. Uh, 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 and so in this regard, cultures evolve. Even religions evolve. Uh, part of adaptation to, to realities, part of adaptation to, uh, to circumstances, part of also individual idiosyncrasies. Uh, and, and so we, uh, uh, and of course, there is uh, the good advantage of hypocrisy. <laughs> there are a lot of people who say uh, we are religious, but they, they behave in different ways. Uh, and they pay lip service. Uh, so saying that I am religious doesn't imply that I'm going to behave in this way. Uh, uh, I might just pay lip service. And I think that's why, for example, uh, uh, Machiavelli uh, and the others uh, have noted, for his, Machiavelli said uh, famously that uh, this idea of Christians turning the other cheek is impractical. How can I turn the other cheek if I... Uh, I want to survive, uh, or if I am a state. Uh, and this is why I think the idea of politics having its own logic has emerged, and it is the essence, I think, of political science is about. But I, if there is a takeaway from this uh, uh, I would like people to have, is that morality and to uh, good conduct, but in fact, they do something else because the necessity of survival force you as a politician, as a political actor, to do these things. And they, they said, well, that's OK. <laughs> I think this way they differ from other people. They said, politics has its logic. Now, of course, uh, I am a person who a little bit disagrees with this, uh, especially when it's used as a, uh, as a rationale, for example, for accepting governance like Assad or, or, or uh, is a, uh, a pattern of ethically defendable compromises. So ethically fundable or ethically uh, rationalized uh, compromises, like for example, giving uh, concessions to minorities, giving concessions to the weak. But giving concessions to the powerful is usually anti-ethical or submitting to uh, to uh, authoritarianism or to despotism or to totalitarianism uh, uh, is not ethically defensible. So I think uh, in lots of my work I try to, uh, 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 to look at this ethical defensible uh, with regard to Islam or with regard to general uh, morality that democracy offers us some system uh, which uh, Machiavelli and Hobbes, for example, did not anticipate. Machiavelli and Hobbes and, uh, uh, and the others, and Baudin, who are pro-authoritarian, thought that authoritarianism is inescapable. But I think the tradition started by Locke and others showed that, no, you can have a viable uh, system which is ethically defendable. Uh, and and that's, in, that's important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Abdul Wahab, and thank you everyone. Thank you.